Professor Tarasenko um, is the author of 300 journal papers, 240 conference papers, three books, and 32 granted patents. In 2000, um, he was elected to a fellowship of the Royal Academy of Engineering and to a fellowship of the Academy of Medical Sciences in 2013. In 2012, he was also made a CBE for services to engineering in the 2012 New Year's Honors List. So we are very fortunate to have him with us here today to share his insights. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to Professor Lionel Tarasenko. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, Max. Um, I, I asked Max to, to shorten it because I want to have maximum time for, for questions. Uh, basically, I've been a prof in university for the past 35 years, and I've done a bunch of stuff during that three and a half decades. But probably the most important fact for today which is not in my CV, is that back in 1988, when I first became an associate professor, I was, I think, the first person in Oxford to do machine learning. It was very much, it wasn't even called machine learning in those days, and it was very much frowned upon by the proper mathematics, uh, statistics, and computer science community. But I stuck in there, and now I'm here to talk to you about generative AI for healthcare. That healthcare should concern us all. Uh, where does generative AI come in and play a role? So, it's here already. The slides seem to have disappeared. Um, do I need to refresh? There we go. Right, okay. So, AI for healthcare is here already. Um, if you're a manufacturer of medical software and so on, the way you get your products out there is more or less entirely controlled by the FDA, the Food and Drugs Administration. They uh, don't just approve vaccines and devices, they approve software as well. And this is about three months old, so the number's probably gone up, but there were five and 23 software as a device, software as a medical device, SAMD, using AI in 99% of cases, we're talking about machine learning, and 75% of those for radiology. And, and the reason why is there's a world shortage of radiologists. So can we combine the idea of, instead of having two human ex experts looking at a mammogram, for example, a woman being screened for breast cancer, can we have an expert and a machine learning algorithm at the same time? And that is now extremely prevalent um, and becoming uh, more and more accepted. We also use machine learning to estimate risk of future uh, adverse events from the available patient data. And there's quite a lot of work in natural language processing as well in healthcare to uh, process and interpret the electronic health records that we generate when we go into hospital or when we go and visit our GP. So my first bullet point is this. Machine learning for healthcare is here to stay. I was mentioning to use uh, breast cancer screening using mammography. There's an independent study carried out by the University of Lund in the last two or three years um, showing that we can use um, uh, AI machine learning to detect uh, early signs of breast cancer as reliably as a human expert will do it. Uh, there's a local company, Brainomics, been spun out in the medical science division here in Oxford, uh, which analyzes CT scans from patients who present at the hospital with suspect stroke. And this app, called the eStroke app, uh, has gone through proper clinical trials and it's reduced, which is very important in the context of uh, someone with suspected stroke, you've got a kind of three hour window and the quicker you diagnose what type of stroke they have, ischemic or hemorrhagic, or they don't have a stroke, the better the patient uh, will do. And they've shown the number of stroke patients recovering with no or only slight disability has tripled from 16% to 48% when this app has been used at the front door with a front door scanner in multiple hospitals in this country. And these results have been achieved with deep learning, which is ideal for image analysis. Those of you who know about machine learning will know that um, extracting implicit features from um, image data is the real achievement of deep learning in the last 20 years. And what we're doing now is to work out how best to combine these machine learning algorithms with an expert, so still a human in the loop, 
and it's very important for healthcare to have augmented intelligence, augmenting the intelligence of the available experts and integrate the algorithms into clinical pathways. So that's where we were, say, four or five years ago. You're all aware, and that's the reason why we have this uh, conference today, this summit. The next breakthrough is Generative Pre-trained Transformers, GPT, which is really what Generative AI is all about. Uh, you've all used, I'm sure, large language models such as uh, ChatGPT, which is GPT 3.5. If you've paid the premium fee, you've also used GPT 4. Underneath all of that, there's a transformer model, which was first described in the literature in a paper called Attention is All You Need by Google researchers just over five years ago. And what is fantastic about the transformer architecture, it makes it possible to encode, and once you've built the encoder, then uses uh, a decoder to generate uh, not just text, but also images and computer code. I check my Python code with uh, ChatGPT. It's much better than my research students are spotting the, the, the bugs in my code. Um, but the key thing, and I've just mentioned that I, I, I still code to this day, is actually not the algorithms anymore. They're all available um, open source. And all my research students, even I'm supervising undergrad projects, final year undergraduates here in Oxford, they are coding up transformers using PyTorch. 150, 200 lines of PyTorch, you have the code to build one of these large language models. It's all open source. It's anybody with a degree of computer science background, even as I say, a final year undergrad level, will be able to do it. The key thing, and especially in healthcare, is the availability of data, and not just the availability of data, but because you have so many free parameters in these models, literally billions, or if you think of GPT-4, that's 13 trillion free parameters in the model, therefore you need data at scale. And what we're doing in healthcare is actually departing from GPT-3.5, from chat GPT, because it's trained on the internet. And the internet's got a lot of false information about healthcare. Therefore, we're retraining it on our own proprietary patient data, having had the appropriate approvals to do so, medical textbooks and research papers. And if we do that, and lots of groups are doing it, I believe we'll have a very significant impact on healthcare within five years. I've just selected four projects because there's a limited amount of time to tell you about. One great one is the doctor who looks at your scan. I had an uh, MRI scan r recently. Uh, the consultant will use software, probably nuances software, to dictate the notes. It's full of medical terms, full of medical abbreviations. There's a group training uh, a large language model using these reports to translate them into plain English that you, the patients, will understand what the consultant has actually found when looking at the image of um, your brain or if it's a whole body scan, your whole body. Primary care is going to be affected. It'll take a while because GPs tend to be resistant, but really diagno diagnosing your disease based on symptoms, uh, your description of it, and then choosing the right drugs to prescribe is a task that will be absolutely ideal for a large language model trained on the right information. That will mean that the doctor now will spend less time on the diagnosis and prescribe aspect of the consultation and give you more time to pick up the signs, body language and so on, a more holistic health approach. So I actually think it's a good thing. It will still be the doctor that will sign off the prescription and have to agree with the output of the large language model. Again, it will provide augmented intelligence for the doctor, not replace her. And if you want a longer discussion of that, look at our paper in the Lancet um, 2018. Moving on now to secondary care, some of the things that we do to predict inpatient mortality or the likelihood of a patient coming back within 30 days after discharge or optimizing the treatment of cancer patients. In dark blue, by the way, these are all applications we're working on. Um, that will be done more accurately than doctors because we can look at a huge amount of electronic health record data, including the vital sign data, that's the blood pressures, the oxygen levels, the temperature, uh, the respiratory rate, the heart rate, so on, and the full blood counts. We can integrate that with a large language model better than the average um, secondary care clinician, such as the emergency doctor clinician can do. But in black, um, because the paper I'm going to show you is from another group in, in one slide, what is really exciting 
about generative AI for healthcare is that healthcare information is multiple forms of data. It's the notes that the doctor writes um, or dictates into um, their tape recorder, which is free text. It's structured text. It's uh, sensor data, for, for example, from the blood pressure monitor. It's images. It's genomic data, so reading your DNA. It's multimodal data. Healthcare par excellence has multimodal data. And if you know how a transformer works through the combination of what happens at the first layer, which is tokenization, and then the creation of high dimensional embeddings that you learn, you can integrate this multimodal data at the input to your transformer. That's fantastic, something we struggled with. We could do deep learning for images, we could use other forms of networks for sensor data and so on. The transformer architecture through tokenization and embeddings solves all of that at a stroke in one go for us, which is absolutely brilliant. So um, just to give you a quick example on cancer treatment, there's a lot of this information, lots of diagnostics tests, different modalities, imaging, uh, blood counts, etc. And um, what you can do and we've started doing is integrating all these digital assets for large patient populations to discover these prognostic features. So it's, it's trying to not diagnose but to um, to predict what's going to happen to the patient so you can optimize the treatment. But the paradox is, and I don't have time to explain it, to do precision oncology, precision cancer treatment, for you individually, you need very large databases. That's the paradox. And one team doing this is this team, it's a Nature Reviews uh, Cancer paper from last year, where you can see they've both got the clinical notes, they've got the radiological information from uh, the MRI scan or CT scan or both for that patient, the pathology information from the tumor inside the body and the genomic data for that patient. And they do the multimodal integration and the input to transform architecture and that improves patient outcomes. Just to give you one application from my own group very quickly because I'd like to take a few questions and I know we started a bit late. Um, we're using wearables to monitor sleep. Come back to me in 10 years, but I think all of you would have monitored your sleep in 10 years' time. Not through uh, consumer wearables that are available from Garmin, from Fitbit and so on. They don't work. Ignore them, right? You learned it from me. They don't work. These will only work when you take the software through the FDA for approval as a clinical device as opposed to a consumer device gimmick. Right? So ignore, they'll tell you you've had three hours of deep sleep, for example, not possible. Um, so please ignore any reports that you get from your consumer devices on sleep. Instead, we're building new algorithms based on smartwatches and also a chest patch that you stick on your chest, you can see it just there on the screen behind me, um, and it transmits the information via Bluetooth for seven days, and at the end of it, we run algorithms and we analyze your sleep. And why do we want to do that? Is because to minimize the risk of chronic disease when you get to my age, or neurodegenerative disease when you get to your 60s and 70s and so on, you need to make sure that you have the right amount of sleep and the, optimize the right type of sleep, which is deep sleep. So sorry, I'm actually showing one technical slide here to show you how we're doing this. Um, so we have um, tokenization through taking 30 second chunks of respiratory waveforms. So you can see on the right of the slide, we also take the heart rate signal, both of these from our wearable. Then you've got the embeddings that we create um, inside um, uh, to the transformer architecture. That's the input embedder. Generate feature vectors. And what we're doing is we're mapping the input sequence of these cardiorespiratory signals to an output sequence, which is what the transformer can do. And in this case, it's the sleep state. So whereas before you need to go to sleep lab, have your brain signals monitored and so on, you can't do that in a home. We're now doing home sleep monitoring and we're doing patient sleep monitoring in virtual wards to optimize the care of that patient. And this is all happening in projects here in Oxford. And just to show you, um, this, this is uh, the bottom trace is the heart rate uh, in amber, you've got the periods of REM, which is dreaming sleep. And you can see actually your heart rate goes up every time you dream. What is important are the periods of N3 
sleep. That's the deep sleep, which occurs mostly at the beginning of the night. You see the subject has had two periods of deep sleep at the beginning of the night, with one extra one at the end of the night, which is rarer. Um, and we've learned that through our transform model, relating the heart rate and breathing rate and their variabilities at different time scales to do effectively this sleep scoring. And this was presented at a US conference for the first time um, last week uh, in Pittsburgh. And why we want to do that, just to leave you with a message, is that by monitoring your sleep in the home, you could do this maybe for seven days, once a year, or once every two years, we can help you devise the right strategy. What type of exercise is the right strategy to optimize your deep sleep, which restores your immune function, improves your memory, minimizes the risk of chronic disease, and so on. For some people, it might be intensive exercise for half an hour. For others, it might be uh, a long walk at speed for an hour. All these kinds of things can be optimized through the monitoring of sleep and um, uh, feeding that information back to the subject. So, to conclude, so I can take some questions. Transform architectures, which are the basis for large language models, will have very positive impact on healthcare, provided they're not trained on the internet. That's my view. Um, but if it's not the internet, we have to generate the data to train them at scale. Diagnose and prescribe, once we can convince the GPs, uh, will become largely automated. The generative AI will be used to suggest a diagnosis, not make it. In secondary care, the type of things I've mentioned to you, prediction of inpatient mortality, to, this is to optimize the clinical pathways, 30-day readmission, or treating cancer. We can now use large language models, transform architectures to diagnose cancer two years ahead of time when a patient doesn't even have, know that they have it. That is tra training on all the available uh, electronic health record data, including free text notes, sensor data, blood counts, and medical images. And with the transformer architecture and the attention mechanism that learns the context in which these various tokens occur, both looking forward and looking backwards, we can map any input sequence, and that includes multimodal data, to any output sequence, typically the time-varying patient's diagnosis or, or status, and that is a really exciting prospect uh, for AI and healthcare, and I only wish I was 30 years younger. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Professor, for the fascinating talk and for the really practical um, cases there. So we, just to align schedules uh, with the other room, we have about five minutes for um, questions, so maybe we'll take two or three. It's quite a few. That one, that one, and that one. I think that's the three. We did start a bit late, so maybe we can run into lunch. It's up to you. If you're hungry, do go. Okay. Thank you for that. It's really interesting. Um, Sal Mohammed here. I work at a company called QTA. We deliver partnerships for AI companies. Um, very interested, we work with a lot of health um, AI companies as well, and you know, you've talked about the diagnose and prescribe. Uh, what do you think about um, personalized medicines for uh, delivered via AI? Do you think something will achieve in the near future, you know, almost printed based on all of these sort of inputs that we're getting and the knowledge that we have? So I think we have to be very careful. I think we still need a human expert in the loop. I think that the, the power of prediction is very high. I think it is quite dangerous to over-monitor oneself and to become obsessed. Um, so when I run with my Apple Watch, all I worry is the time, uh, nothing else. It, it, is, it is a danger as well to become over-informed about one's health. There's a very interesting paper um, this week about polygenic risk scores. There are so many false positives. So I think we, whilst we've got to take charge of our health, we should still make sure that we do it in the context of expert information, that provided by a doctor, a GP, and so on. But then there is the time to do quite a lot to remain healthy and minimize the amount of time that you spend in hospital. What we're trying to do really is to make sure that people like you uh, at your ages uh, remain healthy enough without becoming obsessed so that by the time you get to my age, you don't take up, you don't take up huge amount of healthcare resource. Three quarters of the beds in the NHS are taken up by people um, age 65 or above. Um, 
and a lot of that is preventable and it's education and it's monitoring without over monitoring for people of your age and I think sleep is going to be one of those things because it's really easy to do not every night but a short spell and then get some feedback on how you can optimize your deep sleep uh, the next one was here and then there's one over there yeah, thank you for a very uh, interesting uh, presentation, and it raises lots of questions, but I'll just ask one, okay. um, which is um, you talked about uh, data there and sources of data and said not the Internet. Clearly, the NHS has this wonderful amounts of data. Um, the problem that I've had students who've tried to work with this data, it is very, very hard to convince the NHS to give you any data at all. Can you speak to that a little bit about the uh, likelihood of getting data and how do you get the NHS to trust you that you're not going to misuse the data or something, you know, other things that they're concerned about? So I could speak about that for about an hour, but <laughs> I'll make it very short. At the moment, um, there are two parallel streams, one run, one run by NHS England, which is to build a federated um, uh, data set um, the problem is they're asking Palantir, founded by Peter Thiel, um, a great Trump supporter, I'm sure you know, and developed software for the CIA to build this federated data platform, the FDP. Actually, personally, I don't have a problem with uh, a company that's developed software for the CIA keeping my data safe. It's just I want to make sure that it is used properly. And it's very interesting, the previous speaker mentioned um, Dame Mary Warnock, she was, it was actually the early 80s, I'm that old, I can remember. Um, she was the principal of St. Hugh's, and then the person who turned into recommendations was the principal of St. Anne's, Dame Ruth Deitch. Uh, and likewise, in terms of NHS data, we have the Caldicott principles from Dame Fiona F Caldicott, female head of house of Somerville. So female heads of house have had lots to do with how we use our data. So there are the Caldicott principles for how to use the data. Um, and provided we use those principles and provided patients understand uh, there are so many scare stories and you know, when the, when the contract is awarded and it's gonna be in the next two or three months, if it is awarded to Palantir, lots of people will say, my data will now be um, analyzed by a company that um, you know, provides software to the CIA. No, it'll be held securely by that company. We should still have the same rules. But it is a very complex political field. There's much more. There's also data for research available from NIHR. And unfortunately, NHS England and NIHR don't talk to each other. Uh, and that's one of the complications. There's the idea of opting out of your data being used versus opting in. Um, we still haven't got it right. And that's the reason why your research students can't use it yet, which is a pity. Because if it's fully anonymized, de-identified, then it should be usable by researchers. There's a question in the back. Oh. All right, thanks for the talk. It's been really fascinating. In terms of just adoption of the technologies, do you see that being straightforward, or are there challenges with the, the healthcare systems, the doctors themselves, and, and how long do you think that will take? So it's quite difficult to do adoption of this technology in the healthcare um, because of clinical pathways. Uh, people think, um, you know, this is a system as it is today. Let's work on a weekend introducing this algorithm into the system, come back on Monday and switch on. It's not like that at all. If you have an algorithm somewhere in your pathway, you probably have to redesign the pathway to make it possible to introduce it. And if you introduce it too early, or too late, it won't be of any use. So actually, one of the really important aspects of this is how you introduce your algorithm once you've done the clinical trials to prove that it does work to introduce into the clinical pathways. And that's a huge piece of work. It is being done at the moment. Um, I was the editor-in-chief of something called the Topo Review of NHS Technology. We have Topo Fellows, and often their task is exactly to try and see, okay, for example, breast cancer screening or any other form of uh, cancer screening, how do you integrate that into the NHS workflows is almost as big a question as designing the algorithms and training, training it on the data that you've got, uh, if you've got your data, in order to be able to reproduce human level performance. 
We haven't had one. Uh, there have all been male questions. So can we have one female question, please? It's Sorry, we actually we, they want to take a question online. Online, so okay. Let's, let's well, well, a question online. We only have and then, one more, then we'll take that one. Uh, let me read it out. Um, so Joel Miller asks, what potential is there to extend patient-centric multimodal data beyond the clinical to the social to explore broader patient quality of life, diagnosis, and intervention for long-term health outcomes? What potential has who? Is there to extend patient-centric multimodal data? Who, who's going to link up with whom? Sorry. Um, he asks beyond the clinical to the social. Uh, beyond the clinical to the social. Um, so if I fully understood what the social was, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that there's a trend from secondary care to primary care to individuals. So uh, 60 years ago, your blood pressure was measured in hospital. Um, 50 years ago, it started being measured in primary care. Now, the government quite rightly wants us all to measure our own blood pressure. So um, th there's a trend towards enabling people to become more capable of learning about their own health. Now, some of that is mental health, some of that is social interactions, but again, um, there are um, various apps and so on that can help people with bipolar disorders, uh, which some of which have been trained using machine learning, etc. But the, the, the key thing is that there's a danger, you know, the danger is that we spend too much time on Google already looking at our symptoms, trying to understand for ourselves. It's good to take control of our own health and our um, social interactions and so on, but in terms of health, it's more important to do that within a context whereby your primary care physician guides you in how to do that. Um, because if you look at the wrong source of information or misunderstand it, it can create more damage than it can create good. One final question. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I was trying to point out, that um, we've tended to build machine learning models to analyze images, that's deep learning. We then use machine learning models to analyze how your blood pressure, your temperature, your heart rate, your breathing rate um, varies while you're staying in intensive care, for example, and build predictive models. We've uh, trained machine learning models that look at your blood counts to predict maybe colorectal cancer we can do two years ahead of time. We've got work on polygenic risk scores, uh, looking at your um, DNA and so on. One of the issues is that each one of the applicants I've mentioned is in a different clinical department. The beauty of large language models using the transform architectures is we can put all of that into the model um, and go beyond the boundaries that exist in medicine and the way we're going to prove it's worthwhile is by showing that these algorithms, when you train on this multimodal data, have got better predictive capabilities than when you use just unimodal data. And that is just already beginning to happen. And it's partly because doctors find it very hard to integrate more than two pieces of information. And there we're, in in we're integrating multiple pieces of information and of different modalities. And that will allow us to do precision medicine much better than we can now. Um, one of the difficulties that some people are working on, including in Oxford, is then trying to explain to the doctor why the algorithm has reached this particular conclusion. So explainable AI is still a very uh, new field, and there needs to be a lot more progress. Um, but we need to demonstrate first the improved outcomes. That's always how you use healthcare. Does it improve the patient outcome? And if it does, it shows the power of multimodality at the input. 
And then the explanation will probably be something that we'll have to work on in order to convince the doctors why the integration of this information is better than just treating each bit of information separately. Another warm round of applause for Professor Tarasenko.